Good morning, Church. Shalom. So good to see all of you and your guests with us uh, here or online. Uh, very big welcome to all of you. This is our family here. And so good to be worshipping the Lord together. Now, last week, we were here and we heard from uh, young Pastor Aaron, you know, sharing with us about the power of saying? Yes. Oh, yeah, you, clearly you're here, right? Saying yes. So, join us just. Yes. Only some people. <laughs> okay, now wait, you got next week to do that, all right? Now, clearly, it is uh, very important for us to say yes to the Lord in faith because yes and no, actually, the two words in the English language that represent our agreement or denial to any opportunities, doors that may be open to our life, right? Yes and no are like keys. They can open a door or they can close a door. And depending on who you say yes or what you say yes to, what you say no to, then it could be a door to blessing or a door to all kinds of problems in our life. You know, last week, I actually heard a very, very encouraging testimony that I'd like to share with you. You see, uh, in our church, we have cell groups. And if you're not in a cell group, you should consider joining a cell group. So one of our cell groups meets actually at Jalan Rumah Tinggi. It's the Jalan Rumah Tinggi cell. And in this cell group, one of the cell members had elderly parents who are no longer mobile. Right? So they can't come to church. Uh, they, it's very hard to do things. And one of the things they needed was to get a haircut. Right? You, I mean, you can't come to church where you still need to get a haircut. But they can't bring them to the barber. So this cell member decided to approach the church, the Pastor Irene of uh, Community Services, to ask, uh, Pastor Irene, could you help me find someone who can help cut my parents' hair? And what do you think Pastor Irene said? Yes. yes. Okay, okay, very good. So Pastor Irene said yes, but you know Pastor Irene is not a barber, right? So she had to find somebody. So she went around. She, she knew that in our church, there's Sister Josephine, not sure if she's in this service, but she's a hairstylist. She works around here. She has a, a shop that she, she works at. And she thought, okay, maybe I'll ask Pastor Joseph, uh, ask this Sister Josephine if she can come to the house to cut the hair for these uh, elderly uh, parents. And what do you think, Pastor? Uh, what do you think, Sister Josephine said? Yes. She said, yes. And so Irene and Josephine they made their way to the house of this church member and cut the hair of this uh, the the father and the mother who are not Christians. Now the thing about you know cutting people's hair is that you have captive audience. Uh, they cannot run away. You know. I mean, even in church service, uh, if you're not happy, you can still go to the toilet. Not suggesting, uh, but, you know, so I will go to the toilet. So, while she was cutting their hair, she decided she's going to share the gospel with this uh, uncle and auntie. And you know what? After she's done sharing, the uncle and auntie said, yes, yes and they both accepted Christ last Friday. You know, praise God. And I thought it is such a good story because all the cumulative yes in faith and yes to the Lord leads to a very big and powerful yes. And that's so often how it works in our lives when we say yes to God. I mean, the answer may not always be upon the horizon. You cannot always see the results and you may not even always understand exactly why. But when you say yes, you give your little yes to God, God takes it, puts it all together and something amazing like this happens. Can you say amen? Amen, yes. Amen also, by the way, means yes. So today, you know, as we continue in this, we all look at the other big word. Now, just as yes has the power to open doors, so too, every time you say yes, you are simultaneously saying no to a lot of other things. You know, you're saying yes on the one hand, you're also saying no to a lot of other things when you say that yes. And just as there's power in yes, there's also much power in saying no. In the book of Kings, chapter 1 and verse uh, 19, there's this, this story about this great prophet Elijah who was, you know, looking for someone to succeed his ministry. And he, he had been led to this young man called Elisha. Now, Elisha was running his family business, right? He was uh, someone who would manage uh, this field and he was plowing the field. And we noticed that, you know, when you look at his life, he's got everything set for him. His career was set for him. He owned land. He had oxen and animals. You know, I mean, this guy had everything going for him until that pivotal moment when Elijah presented Elisha with an opportunity. So in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19, it says, So he departed, Elijah departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him and he was with the 12. So, you know, he had land, he had animals, lots of animals. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. That's a cloak, okay? That's not like something mantle on your thing. It's not hard. It's a piece of cloth. Threw on him and he left 
his, the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father and my mother and then I will follow you. So, you know, this seems to be some kind of veiled invitation. I mean, to us, it might seem a little bit strange, but I suppose that at that point in time, Elisha understood that this throwing of the mantle upon him was an invitation to ask him to follow, all right? So, without much context, I think that's the best we can do. Now, Elisha's response is what we want to look at. He immediately said, yes, Ran, runs after this guy and said, yes, I, I don't know about you, you know, someone threw a mantle on you, what would you do? You probably throw it back at him, right? What <laughs> throw it? <laughs> Disturb me, right? But this guy runs out there and says, "Yes, please let me just say goodbye to my parents." But in order for Elisha to say this yes to this invitation, right? Uh, in order for him to say yes to to an opportunity that was being presented, he actually had to say no to quite a lot of things. Because in the very next verse, we find that Elisha turns back from Elijah. He took a yoke of oxen, slaughtered them, boiled the flesh, using the oxen's equipment, basically burned it, right? And gave it to the people. He gave it away. And they ate. So there's no coming back from this, right? There's no like, you know, I changed my mind. I want to go back to my business. That's, he, he was burning his bridges. Then he arose, followed Elijah, and became his servant. <clears throat> he said yes to being a servant. In order to say this yes, he said no <clears throat> to being owner and proprietor, to being an inheritor of the family business. He said no to comfort and security of life that's, I guess, well planned for him. He said no to all these career economic opportunities. And in order to say yes, and because he said yes, today we are talking about Elisha, who has become one of the most prominent prophets of the Old Testament. Even after many thousand years, we still remember him as the one who received a double portion from Elijah. You know, he could have just been another business owner, fades into the pages of history along with millions of other people who have gone in history remaining unknown. Now, this story should remind us of another very similar story, right? Rich young man was invited to follow Elijah sells everything he has and follows him. It reminds us of another story found in the New Testament, which is very similar. It start, starts out pretty much the same. And here, Jesus was the one who was inviting, right? And there was really this, this man who comes to Jesus and wanting to know more about, you know, the kingdom of God and so on. Now, Jesus frequently invites people to follow him. Throughout the gospel, there's no less than 17 times uh, where, you know, Jesus says, follow me. Follow me to different kinds of people tax collectors, and all sorts of people, Jesus, they say, follow me. Today, even in church, Jesus is saying, follow me. He's inviting you. He's not throwing his mantle, as it were, on you, but I think you know, can say something like that. Jesus is inviting us, giving us an opportunity to say yes to him. So this young man comes to Jesus. He was a rich young man. Right? He had lots going for him, like Elisha. Probably has his career all set before him. Now, when they had this conversation, it was very interesting. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, sell all, sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Up to this point, very similar to the other story, right? And of course, Elisha gets up, says, yes, but this young man, he says here, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He could not say yes because he could not say no to his worldly possessions, to his inheritance, to his comfort, to his security. You see, yes and no are intrinsically connected. Whenever you say yes to something, you're also saying no to something else. And this young man could not say no to his self, to his worldly possessions. Therefore, he could not say yes to God. Luke chapter 16 reminds us, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So saying this is something very important to us. So what are the things that we need to say no to, right? I mean, obviously, we need to say yes to God, but what are the things that we need to say no to? Well, the Bible likes to call it the flesh, right? We don't say no to the flesh. This often refers to our natural often selfish inclinations that diverge from God's ways. So Titus chapter 2, verse 11, Paul reminds 
Titus says, For the grace of God brings, that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness. That's it. Say no to ungodliness and worldly lust. Say no to worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify himself for his, as his, for his own special people zealous for good works. In other words, in order for us to become God's people, to become the kingdom of God, the citizens of God, you must say no to ungodliness. You must say no to worldly lust. What I guess you can summarize as the Bible calls flesh. You need to say no to these things. Paul says that, you know, when we say no to these things, we enable, if we enable ourselves to live godly lives, to live the kind of life that God wants us to live. Now, we have often our, find ourselves in situations where we are faced with these types of choices. God on one hand and the flesh on the other. And quite frankly, sometimes it can be quite difficult to resist, to say no. It's not because we don't know. We know what is right. Most of you don't need another sermon to tell you what sin is. Lah. Probably most of you can already preach those sermons, right? You've heard enough of it. We know it, but the problem is our inclinations are so strong that sometimes we find it very hard to say no to these things, right? And that's why it's called temptation. It wouldn't be called temptation if it was easy to resist, right? So what are some of the things that can help us, give us strength and power to say no when we need to say no? Now, a couple of things. In Genesis chapter 30, 39, verse 7 to 9, there was this another young man who, who was finding himself in such a situation, young Joseph. He was facing temptation. So I want to look at this story to find at least two anchors that can give us strength to say no. I'm going to read this from Genesis 39, verse 7 to 9. And it came to pass after these things that his master, master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and said, she said, lie with me, sleep with me, right? Now, uh, the Bible doesn't tell us what kind of woman this was, other than she was, you know, a uh, lustful woman. But I would assume, okay, just for the sake of uh, dramatization, I would assume she must be quite a good-looking woman, right? I mean, because Potiphar, the master, was very wealthy, very powerful. He could marry anyone. He had choices. Lah. So I would say, because of that, she must have, he must have chosen someone fairly good-looking, right? He married well, at least as far as looks is concerned. So, this pretty young lady, right, this wife of this Potiphar, says to young Joseph who was serving there, lie with me, sleep with me. But the Bible says, but he refused. He said, what did he say? No. He said no. And said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in this house. In other words, the master doesn't know what's going on here. You know, for some people, there's all the more reason to say yes. Right? Nobody knows what you don't know. You don't say, I don't say, nobody says. So he says, no, the master doesn't know what's going on with me in this house and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There's no one greater in this house than I. Now when he says servant here, I really, it's more like a chief steward, right? He's in charge of everything. He has, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, like Garden of Eden. Huh? Any tree can, this one tree cannot because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So, where did Joseph, young Joseph, find the power and the strength to say no when presented with, you know, and uh, for some people, a golden opportunity, right? Wow, the woman wants me, and you know, young men, young men are being young men, the same last time and same now, right? I guess they all have carnal desires. Where did Joseph find the strength? I think there are two anchors he had. Two strong anchors. The first anchor that Joseph had was his loyalty to God. Everyone say loyalty. Joseph was loyal to God. You know, he said, how can I sin against God? He was thinking about God. Many times when we are going through life, we are not thinking about God. To be very honest, we only tend to think about God when we are in trouble, right? I mean, when you're going on holiday, you don't think about God, what? You're just thinking about where you're going. Wow, I'm going to New Zealand. I can't wait to see the, you know, I don't know, kiwi or whatever it is down there, right? In New Zealand, whatever it is in New Zealand, I would just say kangaroo, but that's Australia, right? But if the plane suddenly go bumpy like that, you think, oh God, please help us land safely, right? You only think about God when things go wrong. 
right? Well, for Joseph, he was mindful of God. In this moment of, you know, temptation or this moment of opportunity as presented, he was thinking, but God, God wouldn't want this. I, I would be sinning against God. He was mindful of God. We are at our weakest in the face of temptation when God is far away from your hearts and from your minds. Joseph's loyalty to God kept him firmly anchored when the waves of temptation threatened to sweep him off his moorings. That helped him fast. You know, I used to work on a ship, right? And uh, one of the most important things you can have with a ship is not the sail, but the anchor, right? When you stop, you drop an anchor that holds you in place because there's always currents that threaten to sweep you off. And, you know, while anchor be very dangerous, you could be grounded or you could collide with other ships. So anchor is very important. So this anchor kept him safe when the currents were pulling him in some other direction. His, his loyalty to God, his strong love for God gave him strength to say no. I don't know how strong that anchor is for some of us. For some of us, we, we like God. Right? I don't know how much we love God, but we definitely like God. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here today. But you're facing a challenge, you're facing temptation. Think about your loyalty to God. Se- Joseph's second anchor rested in his loyalty to his master. His friend, right? His master and his friend. His relationship with his master meant something to him. He thought, you know, my master trusts me so much, I cannot betray the trust of this master who loved him. So he was loyal to the people around him. And that was more important to him, more valuable to him than the momentary offer of fleshly fulfillment. If Joseph had hated his master, Right? Maybe the Joseph, I can't stand this master. Oh, now I've got a chance uh, to get back in the master, you know, revenge. You know, the story could have ended a little bit differently. But Joseph was the kind of person who valued the relationship, the people around him. And this is another very strong anchor. When you're facing temptation, your love for your loved ones, your love for your family, your love for your friends, the trust that's been invested in you by your community, community around you, they give you strength to say no. Right? So it is important for you to, to find yourself in a network of strong, godly believers. People whom you love. Invest in these people, invest in these relationships. And in a moment of temptation, you think about them and say, you know what, I can't sin against them. I can't betray their trust. And that gives you a second anchor. So two anchors, very strong. You know, your relationship with God, your relationship with people, very strong. They hold you steadfast. And this is something that we all need to do, right? We all need to do, to invest in our relationship with God. You do that in small ways. Reading your Bible. I don't know whether Joseph read his Bible that morning. Maybe he did. Right? Maybe he read that morning about how Eve disobeyed God. I don't know. I guess I'm just joking. But you know, I maybe he was meditating on the Lord. And when that happened, he remembered the Lord. Of course, if the last time you read the Bible was last month, then maybe at that point of time, you're not going to be thinking of that. I think... It's also important for us to be in good fellowship. So invest in these things. I'm not sure where you are in your life, but these two are very important anchors. They strengthen you, they fortify you, they give you strength to say no when you need to say no. Now, temptations don't just show up randomly from nowhere, right? Uh, and the Bible says in Luke chapter 14 that they tend to come up during opportune times. So when Jesus was tempted in Luke chapter 4, the devil, having ended every temptation, because Jesus kept saying no, right? Every time... Jesus do this. Jesus said, no, 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 no. Okay, the devil kind of got fed up. The Bible says, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Until an opportune time. So the question I have is this, what is an opportune time? Right? What is an opportune time for temptation? It turns out, any time can be an opportune time when our guard is down. Any time can be an opportune time when our state of mind is wrong. Right? It's not in a good state of mind. And the state of mind, what goes on inside here is very important to determine whether we say yes or no to the right or wrong things in our lives. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7 says that, you know, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So your thoughts shape you. Your thoughts determine your action. They eventually bubble up to the surface and they manifest themselves in your actions, your speech, your behavior. So often, the things you need to start saying no to is not just the outcome, but the seed, right? And the seed is in your thoughts. You say no to certain things that are going on in your minds. It could be negative thoughts, thoughts of condemnation. Today, we had a word of reminder. Sometimes you, the devil sows 
words of condemnation in your minds and your thoughts, making you feel weak, unloved, incapable, useless, right? Telling you that you're unimportant, that nobody likes you, casting doubts on God's promises, all these kinds of things. If you find yourself dwelling on these types of thoughts, you need to learn to say, no, there is a problem, you know. Don't know whether to say no or not. Yeah, you need to say a more strong no to these things, right? I mean, constantly we are bombarded with these things, right? Some of the greatest distraction in our life comes in the form of fear and doubt. And that's what the devil does to tell you to, you know, ask you to join ushering. I don't know, man. I doubt if I could do it, you know. I don't know if it would take up too much of my time. So I say no, right? Instead of saying yes, or maybe you're going to, you're thinking of going on a mission field, going to have a mission trip. I don't know. I'm afraid that if I go there, I don't have enough money to go for my holiday, right? Uh, something like this. You need to say no to some of these dwelling thoughts. Some of the thoughts may be condemning. No, I cannot, I'm no good. Anna, you know? I've always been told that I'm no good. That all these things you need to manage, they are all internal. They're not external. They're internal to you. So you have to be the one to say no to these thoughts. Luke chapter 12, verse 25, you know, Jesus was saying that, and which of you by worrying, that's by dwelling on your anxieties, by dwelling on your fears and your doubts, by worrying, can add one cubit to your stature. You cannot become taller. If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest, right? Why allow these things to dominate your minds? Conversely, in Philippians, the Bible says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Say yes to these things, to good things, to the thoughts of God and goodness in your life. So there are things that are negative in your mind, critical thoughts, right? Many critical things that you're thinking about or maybe just thoughts of condemnation. Say no to those, say yes to godly thoughts. These hidden thoughts of our mind, they will eventually appear. Not just as thoughts, but as, thought, as speech, as actions. Saying no to godly thoughts is part of saying no to a lot of other things that enable you to say yes to God. Now, when these things become an action for too long, right? when your thoughts are not guarded and they are not controlled, after a while it becomes re repetitive action and they become habits in your life. Habits sometimes you do without even thinking. Right? There are many things that we do without thinking that you don't realize it. You know, many people drink coffee so that they don't fall asleep. But if you drink enough coffee after a while, some people don't drink coffee, they cannot sleep. You know, there are people who are like this. Any of you here, by the way, you need deliverance from coffee. Right? But some of us, I know people who, if they don't drink coffee, they cannot sleep because it has become a habit. It's no longer about the power of coffee. It's the power of the habit. Right? And habits are things you do often without thinking. Sometimes we didn't even think about complaining, we already complained because it has become a habitual thing for you. Gossiping is another thing. So habits are difficult to kick. My wife told me, say that, you know, habits are very difficult to kick because you, you kick the H, you still got a bit left, you know, right? You kick the A, the bit is still there, right? And you kick the B, it is still there. And someone told me, uh, unless you get rid of the I, uh, then you only left the cross of uh, the T, right? So habits are difficult to kick for us, but we all need to manage our habits. Say no to certain habits in our life. Whether it could be a habit of procrastinating, things you need to do that you know you want to do, that you know you should do, you want to say yes, but you end up saying no. Like many of you, at the start of this year, you say, you want to read the Bible this year. Now already, July already. Right? And I'm quite sure you haven't gone through Genesis. Uh. I know Genesis is a long book, right? But come on, right? <laughs> it's July already. Right? By now, it should be Psalm, somewhere in the Psalms already, right? So we want to do it, but you keep, I think I'll do it tomorrow. Procrastination is a habit. It's a habit that you need to say no to, right? For some people, eating is a habit, lah. Eating, huh? we've got a seafood diet. Seafood must eat food, right? So the seafood diet. Or complaining. Complaining about things. One of my friends likes to complain. You know, every week, you know, when we talk, he will have some... I, I don't know what he's going to complain about, actually, but I'm quite sure he's going to complain about something. Every week is something different, right? So I know that this person manages things by complaining. I'm thinking, you know, that's a habit that he's probably not aware of and he needs to kick the habit. 
obsessing. Some of us obsess over small, small things to the detriment of the bigger things, right? So we miss the forest for the trees. And we tend to get so tied up in things until it starts to frustrate us, gets all wound up and you know, upset about things. That's a bad habit you may need. Gossiping, another one, right? There are many, many of these habits in our life that are unhelpful that you need to say no to if you want to say yes to God. And sometimes with habits, it's so difficult to kick that you need to borrow from the strength of other people. Having friends around you that can help you gently nudge you. Like my friend, I would tell him, hey, you know, maybe, maybe we shouldn't complain so much, lah, you know, because I know, I know it's true, but if we complain so much, it will poison our hearts. It makes us toxic and we become cynical and very unhappy. It will rob your joy, right? Then after I say that, this friend of mine will say, mm, yeah, actually you're right, lah. Yeah, okay, we shouldn't complain so much. Lah. Two weeks later, it starts again. But, you know, my job is to help him. Right? So every time he starts, I'm there gently tell him, hey, don't do it, lah, you know. And then he starts again, don't do it, lah. One more time, pow, you know, okay, I'm <laughs> encouraging him in the name of Jesus, obviously, you know. But that's what friends are here for. You're not just fighting this fight alone. We're all in this together, right? So you need to be found in a company of godly people who love you enough to gently help you kick some of these habits. Because a lot of times uh, you are not aware of the things you're doing. Amen? Okay? So we need to have, get help to deal with some of the things we need to say no to in our lives. Don't be a lone ranger. We have to say no to unnecessary things in our lives in order to create room for the necessary things, the important things of our life, right? Not everything you say no to is obviously bad. Sometimes they're just unnecessary. There are many unnecessary things that we do in our life, like spending a lot of time scrolling on the phone, right? TikTok, Instagram and all that. You know, the the strongest muscle in your whole body is this one, you know? Because every day you practice exercise, uh, right? But you know, this thing, while I suppose it's not overtly sinful or anything like that, right? But it wastes a lot of time. It takes up a lot of your energy and your resources. And it even happens even to me. You know, I might be typing my sermon halfway. Message comes in, you know. Hey, check this out. Oh, check what oh, this cat doing. doing jump, jump, jump. And then another cat. And you know, they know. They put all the cat videos. They know you like cat videos. They show you all the cat videos, right? Then cat jumping here, cat running here, cat climbing. Oh, next thing, dogs already, right? Then rabbits. And before you know it, one hour gone, you know. And I'm not grown at all spiritually, uh, to be honest. Maybe I've grown older by one hour. You, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Uh, you know, right? Because it happened to you also, right? It happens to all of us. And at some point, I have to stop myself and say, no, <laughs> get thee behind me, right? i got work to do, things that are more important in our lives to do. Recently, I've been um, packing a little bit in my house because I'm doing a bit of renovation. I had to move out for a short while and I come back again. And you know what? While I'm packing, I discovered that one of the best ways of packing is throwing things away, you know? Because there are many, many things that I threw away. About half of my things I threw away, I realized I don't need in my life. I got clothes that I don't even know when I bought or where it came from, right? I, maybe I bought wrongly or whatever. I, so did I really buy this taste? This clothes, my taste not like that one, right? I throw away. Books that I bought that I said, you know, I'm definitely going to read this book. Today, uh, I haven't plastic also haven't come off, right? <laughs> Which goes to show that I'm crowding out my life with things that are unnecessary. If it were necessary, I would have used it already. The fact that they are still there, unnecessary. Obviously, things that I've forgotten are like, I found a whole set of keys, you know. I, I don't know which door it goes to now. I don't know whether the door still exists. Maybe the old office keys, right? Now, in all our lives, it's like this. Now, what happens? Harmless what? Well, they might be harmless, but they occupy space in your house. Space that could be used for better things that are actually needful for you. So, when you spend a lot of time in the unnecessary, you need, those, you need to say no to those things in order to create space, energy, and resource to say yes to God. So you wonder, why is it so hard to say yes to God? Well, partly because you've got all these things going on in our lives, right? Now, you know, we want to say yes to God. We want to say no to ungodly things, say no to the flesh, say no to the, the I guess, the unnecessary things in our life. Because Ephesians tells us that we need to be circumspect. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, it says, See that you walk circumspectly. Look around carefully, right? Not as fools, because, you know, fools rush in. Right? Be wise, but as wise, redeeming the time, making the most of your time, not just time, but your life, your resources, your energy, your attention, because the days are evil. So be mindful. 
Think about what you want to say yes or no to. Don't always wait until the last minute to decide. Because when you are not prepared, you have not walked circumspectly, you have not planned what is important in your life. When you come to that moment, you won't be able to say yes or no. The circumstances will make the decision for you. You just go along with the crowd. And one of the people who are most, I find most inspiring, is actually my own namesake, uh, Daniel, the Bible Daniel, uh, who was a very young boy when he was taken away as a captive, as a exile, uh, into exile in uh, Babylon. And there, he was given a new name, a new identity, right? Brought to a new country, a whole new life. They're going to make him a new person. They're going to make him a Babylonian. But this young Daniel was remarkable because he knew who he was. He was very clear about his goals, his priorities. He was very clear about his loyalties to God. And because of that, he said something that was, I thought, you know, he did something that was, I think it's very pivotal to his whole story. And it's found right at the beginning of that, the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8. Is, the Bible says, But Daniel purposed in his heart. He decided right from the start he was going to say yes to God. He purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine that he drank. Right? So, right before anything happened, before the lions showed up, before the fire, before all those kind of things, he made up his mind before it happened that he was going to say yes to God. That's my loyalty. I'm going to say no to the royal delicacies. I know Singaporeans, we love food. Huh? And it's very hard for you to say no to good food. And here, Daniel was saying no to the royal delicacies. You know, I heard that in China, Beijing, you can go to certain places where they serve you what was the emperor's food. You know? And many of these small, small dishes come out. This was what the king's ate. You pay good money for that, right? You will go all the way to eat these things. Daniel was going to get that. He says, you know what? I'm going to say no to these things. Therefore, he requested the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He said no beforehand. Now, here's a very good strategy because sometimes uh, if you wait until the food is already served, the food is already in front of you on the table, you say no. Oh, it can be a bit hard lah, right? because oh, it looks quite good. Uh. You close your eyes, uh, then the smell comes out. <sighs> yeah, it's hard to say no. And even those who try very hard at your friend right next to you, are, wow, very good. Uh. You want or not? Well, at that time, uh, you want how to say no. You follow what I'm saying? Sometimes you've got to say no well beforehand. Don't even go there. Say no. While it is easy to say no. I always say, you want to fight Goliath. Uh. Better fight when Goliath is young. Uh. Don't wait until he's old. Then you fight him harder. So, it is important for us to say no as a matter of your heart. Say no to certain decisions that you make before you arrive. Don't just wait until you are at the point of crisis to say yes or no. So, this young man, you know, Daniel in the Bible, he was very clear where his loyalties were. He made up his mind way ahead of time. And all of us here today, it will help us if you make up your mind way ahead of time before you have to say yes or no to know clearly what you need to say. You know, if you are facing this today, I want you to know all of us go through this. We are all human. Every one of us, we face this kind of challenges through our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such that is common to men. We all face this. Young and old, men and women, we face situations, circumstances. I wouldn't be surprised if right now, this very morning, some of you are in the middle of a battle, spiritual battle. You're in the middle of a warfare for your soul. You're in a situation where you're standing on the precipice. You're not sure you know, whether to say yes or no. Or maybe you know you're supposed to say yes, but you dare not say yes, or perhaps you know that you're supposed to say no, but yet, you know, it's so tempting. You find yourself just crossing over the line a little bit. If that's you, the Bible says, listen, your struggle is not new. It is common to all men, but God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with each temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So you can do it, right? You can do it. God has given you the power to do it. Some of the things you can do, invest in your relationship with God. Don't wait until it comes later. Invest. Small things, praying, reading the Bible. It might not seem very great or important to you, but this little yes to God here will give you the strength to say no 
down the road when you need to say it. Invest in your relationship with people, your fellowship with godly men and women around you, not just any people who gossip with you. Ah. And because some friends will help you gossip one. Ah. But with godly people will tell you, hey, don't do this. Ah. Let's try to you know, be good Christians. Let's try to follow the way of God, the way of purity. Be in the company of brothers and sisters who will help you to say no in the face of temptation, who will guide you. Be mindful of your thought life. What is going on in your mind here, right? Someone used to say that uh, um, uh, idle mind is the workshop of the devil. Huh? So think very carefully about what is going on inside. Say no early. Stop them at the, at the thought before it becomes an action, right? Reject ungodly thinking. Consider your goals and your priorities. The big picture. Where do you want to be five years from now, ten years from now? Will your saying yes or no to whatever it is that's before you help you get there or will it not? You know, I mean, you're scrolling through. Will this help me get where I want to be 10 years from now? No. Uh. Maybe I should stop this. You see, put them into proper perspective. Determine beforehand what you will say no to. There are certain lines you need to draw in your life. Say, you know what? This one cannot. This is not negotiable. This is not even something I want to sit down and consider, pray about it. Nothing to pray about. Just decide beforehand to say no. And actually, there's one last thing. Last very important thing that can help us to say no. Want to guess what that is? Pray long, right? Jesus says, when you pray, you pray like this, right? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, right? Help us to say no to temptation, basically. And we can pray when we are faced with these things. So in closing, you know, as we close our eyes and as we pray, if you are someone, you're facing one of these struggles, I want you to bring that before the Lord. We are all here together, but you bring that before the Lord and ask God to give you strength. I pray that this sermon will help you, will encourage you to say no, give you a bit more strength to say no because you know that's something that you need to say, something in your life, and also to say yes. Lord, we thank you because, you know, with each temptation you say, you have made us a way for escape. Today, Lord, some of us here are going through big challenges or even small challenges. Some of us are facing temptations in our life for which we need to say a very clear decisive no but we are finding a bit hard to find the strength for that today Father I pray through these words of encouragement these words in the Bible we may find some strength to say no Father we want to be loyal to you help us not to betray that trust Lord we are loved by people around us help us not to betray their trust either Lord help us to say no and last of all Lord we pray lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil in Jesus' name we ask and we pray. Amen, amen. Shall we stand together? I'm going to try and sing this song. I know it's a bit tricky to sing, but uh, it is Lord's Prayer. I thought it's a good way to end this sermon.
So Lord, this is our prayer, Lord, that you will help each one of us. Lord, we want to draw closer to you as we enter into the second half of this year, Lord. Things that we have been putting off, procrastinating, that we said yes to, but somehow got lost in a way. Lord, today we want to renew that yes. Help us to say no to things that are holding us back. And as to go from this place now, Lord, we ask that you will bless us, that your blessing will come with us as we strive to pursue you with all our hearts. Blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with all of you and remain with your families now and always. Amen. Amen.